Uh, hi everyone, so my name is Carl and uh, I'm sure that you're all just as tired as I am. I've been in a conversation with multiple storage and computer vendors for the last eight hours, so I feel great about that. Um, <laughs> and I know you, you've all been here in a, in a room, although it's the air conditioning in here is much better than the room I was in, so I'm, I'm a little jealous of that. Uh, so anyways, you've actually met a couple of well, at least one of the people from my group over there, Greg, he's uh, one of the TAs, and uh, my group basically is, we're located over at UHN, and we service all of the genomics data that comes in at UHN. So that includes both research sequencing as well as clinical sequencing. And we have a group of bioinformaticians, uh, Greg being uh, one of our leads in that group, who actually run the clinical bioinformatics workflows uh, and who do all the validation and testing. So today we're not really going to be going into a hands-on sort of thing, but I, I, it's, I really want to create some awareness as to sort of the um, some of the issues that you run into when you actually start to try to lock things down for clinical use as opposed to just research use. So that's the topic for today. Um, if anybody has any questions, please just interrupt uh, as I go along. So the learning objectives of this module are to gain insights into the complexities that you have when you're uh, doing clinical accreditation, understanding how the goals uh, in genomics and research are different uh, from those in clinical testing, and really starting to appreciate some of the importance of validating not only the results that you get, but validating the software, the infrastructure that the software is run in, the software infrastructure surrounding it, like what versions of, of Unix and Linux you're running, and all the different types of libraries and everything, making sure it's all documented that have to go into your documentation for a clinical test. And then understanding some of the problems and pitfalls that you can, can see sometimes when you're doing panel-based testing. And so today we're going to be mostly talking about cancer. Um, because most of our testing uh, from uh, on the clinical side is is in the context of either clinical research trials, uh, which are primarily cancer focused, or just uh, general uh, standard of care type testing uh, that's done in the clinical labs. So here's just a short list of some of the factors that we uh, have to consider when we're talking about taking a test from the research domain and making it into a clinical test. Uh, you know, we talk about archiving, so when you have the data, how many copies do you have, how you protect that data, are you using techniques like erasure coding, how, you know, how many, how many, what's the lifespan of that data, uh, how long do you have to retain that data for, how do you set those policies for retaining the data, uh, and where it's stored. Uh, communication between the lab and the bioinformatics staff. So we actually have set up a ticketing system specifically be, uh, for communication between us and the clinical lab so that we can log everything. Uh, and some of those logs actually are used as part of our validation when we go back uh, to our accreditation agencies as well. Security is obviously a big thing because the data that we deal with is uh, not de-identified at all. So. The files in th that we get often contain uh, patient names and MRNs, which are the medical record numbers for the patients as they're admitted into the hospital. Uh, so we have to make sure we enforce strong security uh, across uh, access to those files. How do we audit that security? How do we audit access to those files and all those types of things? Um, and then the fact that we actually use a really vast array of panels uh, for different types of tests. So we might use uh, the Illumina Amplicon type uh, panels for certain types of tests, but then when you go into a pathology specimen and you have a very small amount of tissue in there, um, as, as you're doing a core in an FFPE or something like that, uh, you actually have to use something like the ion proton because the amount of, it just does, the Illumina just does not work at that low of a sample volume. Uh, so we have to then come up with a protocol, SOP, and a validation document for running the test on the ion proton as well. And then coming up with various uh, ways to standardize to make our lives a little bit easier, especially around the pipeline, so that we're not constantly writing new pipelines and just looking at it as a more of a modular approach. Those are some of the factors that we like to consider. And the goals and considerations. So when we're talking about research, uh, obviously reproducibility is a huge factor in, in research, uh, sample quality, cost. Um, it can be very exploratory in nature. It's not always hypothesis driven, uh, but that's typically kind of in the realm of a discovery uh, type of application. When we move over to clinical standard of care, 
Uh, so this would be somebody coming in uh, with a cancer and they need to have BRAF mutation testing or something like that, or BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation testing. Uh, we're looking really at the goal is actionability, right? So the, uh, finding those mutations that have an actionable uh, uh, case that we can make for them to be treated with a certain way or for some kind of screening mechanism or whatnot. Uh, when we, similarly, when we're doing clinical trials, uh, like bringing people in through different new drugs that are coming in through different pipelines, all of that falls under that kind of clinical, uh, clinical envelope, uh, and we have to look at a various set of requirements. So, for example, CAP-CLIA and OLA. Uh, CAP-CLIA is College of American Physicians, uh, and CLIA, those are both American accreditations, and so hospitals use that if they're actually accepting uh, samples from the United States. Uh, and then if you're in Ontario, uh, usually we fall under something like OLA, which is the Ontario Lab accreditation for that. Uh, as I said before, we go through a big process of validating our infrastructure, software, bioinformatics workflows. Uh, we have to make sure everything is uh, tracked and our pipelines are, are, are versioned properly and we have SOPs for everything. Uh, PHIPAA, in Ontario at least, is one of the major uh, privacy envelopes that we have to make sure that we're following as well. Uh, and that kind of falls under that security realm I was talking about before. Uh, you know, thinking about how we interact with other labs, right? So often when you're developing tests uh, in a clinical lab, you're swapping samples uh, from one lab to another. Uh, and in fact, when we're talking about CAPCLIA uh, inspections, they actually will send us some bioinformatics data, they'll send us the FASTQ files, and then we have to run them through our pipeline and then send them back a matrix of the results we have. And then they test, then they go against the what they know is the gold standard truth for those, and then they score us on that. Um, actually, that's voluntary at the moment, but it probably won't be voluntary for too long. Uh, but we're, we're doing that. And, um, you know, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to nail down a couple of, a couple of arms here, the, the main arm being you know, make this test as black and white as possible, as opposed to the more fuzzy kind of research side of things. Um, and also drive the cost time, the cost down, uh, the turnaround time for when the sample arrives in the lab and how long it takes to run through the bioinformatics pipeline. Make sure that we have backups, uh, a backup system to run the pipeline in case one of them goes down and all those kinds of things so that we can enforce a strict turnaround time on, on sample processing. So good, everybody. Any questions at all? So as I said before, uh, clinical accreditation really uh, Ontario OLA and U.S. samples uh, CAP and CLIA. And one of the things that we have to do is create a lot of documentation, which has to be approved, signed, and dated by the laboratory director. And uh, you know, this sounds trivial, but actually, like our documentation for some of this is. You know, we have validation documents that run in the hundreds of pages uh, for some of our panels that we've had to validate. And uh, in terms of writing the SOPs, even a simple SOP for running a small panel can be 30, 40, 50 pages in length. And I'll show you an example of that. Uh, the documentation that we have includes uh, all the pipeline details, of course, the standard operating procedures, uh, the procedures for updating the panel. If we take a component out, so if you're using a version of SAM tools or Indel Realigner and you want to swap out a new version but everything else remains consistent, you have to have a process in place for documenting that change and how that's, that goes into your pipeline so that you know when you ran that particular version that it's been with that version and that's very um, transparent. Uh, and then of course data security policies are always important and making sure that we have lots and lots of logs of everything so that we know everything that's happened to the sample from the minute it comes into our hands to when we deliver it back to the molecular pathologists who then uh, will sign out the case uh, on the clinical side. Um, so just going into the logs for example, so when we run our pipeline, so you today I think you've been running uh, some, some of the command lines just, just from scratch, so you've been going through each step at a time. So what we do is we take all of those command lines and we wrap them up into big, bigger scripts written in Python. Uh, some of them are written in Bash uh, just to spread them out across our cluster so that they can compute at the same time and so that we can optimize our turnaround time. There's a lot of little tricks in that regard. And because we're running a lot of samples all at the same time, we have to make sure that we're uh, keeping track of you know, the exit status of each job. 
So when a jaw ran, if you ran, uh, you know, um, your your your, S, your SNP caller, that you know that it actually exited cleanly on that particular sample, and that all steps for that particular sample exited cleanly with no errors, and you have to check that manually at the end to make sure that all those samples met those requirements. Because if they didn't, then you have to go back and trace through and figure out what happened and rerun the pipeline again and document that you had to do that. Um, and that happens occasionally, and it can happen for a variety of reasons, including a problem with the sample file itself or even just a node on our system uh, that we're doing the computation on just goes down, just dies or gets overloaded or something, runs out of memory, and then it, the, the job dies there. And so we have to go back and make sure that that's all cleaned up. So there's a lot of details in here, and that's what Greg gets to do. <laughs> He's laughing over there because I'm making it sound like it's only five minutes of work, but it's like six months of work for run, doing a panel like this, basically. What's that? Push a button. Push a button and make it go, I wish, yeah. Uh, so here's an example of, of, you know, the level of detail that we have in one of our SOPs. Uh, so here's, for example, one part of that document. You know, it's very detailed. Notification of bioinformatics staff of the completion of a NextSeq or MySeq run. Lab staff responsible for running it has to do uh, notify the staff using the ticketing system. Here's the email that they have to send that ticket to. <laughs> email has to include the following information and then proceed to the next step. And it's really, it's so dumbed down. Like you could, I could get my mother, probably, maybe, to actually run this because really you should, anybody should be able to just sit there and blindly follow that SOP, not have any idea what they're doing, but be able to, to run and launch that pipeline and have it all documented at each step. So that's the, that's the purpose of the SOP. When we're, when we're doing uh, the panels, so here's an example here of a typical workflow that we, that we use. And we have different workflows for different types of samples that come into the lab. So if we have a paired tumor normal sample processing uh, type uh, set that comes in, and, and that's obviously preferred because then we can remove some of the, the, the common variation that's in the, in the normal portion of the person's genome as compared to the, the cancer portion, uh, we have a particular pipeline that we have to run those samples through. And I'm going to go into that in just a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, but you can see here that actually we don't just run Mutec, for example, which is the standard tool for calling variants in cancer samples when you have a paired cancer and normal uh, sample. In fact, we actually run uh, Varscan for the indels because Varscan does better on the indels, we found through experience. Um, and we use Mutec uh, to look for the somatic changes that, are, that occur. And uh, for the germline SNPs, we actually use uh, Varscan for both of those. And so we actually use a combination of tools to try to get to what we think is the truth for that particular sample. Uh, same thing goes if we have a single tumor or blood sample processing. We have a workflow that we use particularly for that. And so you might be wondering on the left side there, um, looking at that paired tumor normal sample uh, call processing, like why do we actually do three different uh, variant callers for the same pair of samples. And the reason is, on this slide here, you can see this is basically showing you that if you, for example, in the, in the clinical lab, we typically have a threshold uh, for germline calls, so a variant that's found in the blood, of 20% minor allele frequency. And we use filters to remove common variants that are found in the 1,000 genomes and ESP and EXAC and things like that. Um, the problem occurs is that if you, is that if you have a very low frequency allele, a very low frequency minor allele frequency, when you're using Mutec, Mutec is so sensitive that it won't actually call a somatic variant if it sees even a very low frequency SNP at that same location, even if that's probably just a machine error. So even if it's just at the background. And this can be a major problem. So for example, if you're looking at something like BRCA1, Really, at the end of the day, in a, in a cancer specimen, we don't really, if, if the person's on like a PARP trial or something like that, we don't really care if the person has a germline or a somatic mutation. We just want to know that they have a BRCA mutation that's predicted to be deleterious. But if you just ran mutec on that particular tumor specimen, you would only, I, sorry, you wouldn't see anything. You wouldn't see the, the, uh, that SNP come up in that location because maybe there's like a very, very low frequency mistake 
in the in the germline. And so for that reason, in order to pick those up, we actually have to run multiple different pipelines on the, each of the specimens separately, both in paired mode and in single mode, to try to get the truth of what's actually there in the, in the specimen. So you only call it if all the colors agree. What's that? You only call it if all the colors agree. On uh, well, actually, they may may not. They, in this case, they don't agree, right? So, um, so they they agree, but the one of them is wrong, right? <laughs> so when you're running the germline, it's probably a mistake. The, if you have like a an allele in BRCA1 that's at a minor allele frequency of like five or six percent, it's definitely a mistake, or almost definitely a mistake, and all the ones that we've looked at have been mistakes and have been re-verified in the lab again, running the sample on a tangential technology, have been have been wrong. It's just been a sampling uh, or a sequencing artifact, um, but because it's there, it actually makes MUTEC make a mistake when it's calling or not calling that particular location. So that's just one of the... What's up? Oh, yeah, do you want to repeat the original question? Oh, okay. No, he just he said uh, his question was: Is it just that you're looking for the consensus of all three of them? And it would be great if it was just looking for the consensus. But actually, we're looking for the, we're looking for consensus, but for consensus not but the consensus not being true though, right? So the germline is actually a false positive. So that's what we're trying to to weed out those. Uh, and then, of course, um, this is actually. Uh, going back a little bit here, so this is um, an another example of, of, of some of the things that I was uh, talking about before about the, the, the types of things that we need to document. And this is actually looking at how the very detailed informatics flow of the data, so how we actually take data, move it from one place to the other. It's all really kind of boring stuff, but it all has to be documented very well uh, so that you can use that for an, inspect an inspection when they show up because they'll when they do these SNAP inspections, they'll ask you sometimes for this documentation. Um, let me just blast ahead here, actually. And we're going to go right into a case study here. So we run a panel at uh, UHN that we designed in-house, which is called the Hi5 uh, panel. It's 555 genes related to cancer. Uh, it's used for screening a variety of different uh, indications. and. Uh, most of these are, we're looking at things that may be suitable for drugs that target specific mutations or can bin uh, the patients into one population of responders versus non-responders and things like that. So when we were, when we were tasked to, to validate this particular panel here, so we'd obviously, we'd run this many times on the research side, but then we had to bring this into the clinical side. So we had a, a, a strategy here where we, uh, first of all, uh, we developed the panel um, it's, that's actually from another one, this is 48 genes, the TrueSeq Amplicon cancer panel. Uh, and we, we have that data from an orthogonal panel basically run on the Illumina. The same genes are run there and those 48 genes are part of our 555 genes. We have those, uh, many of those genes are also part of our, uh, the, the comprehensive cancer panel, which is an ion life product. And then we have public data, for example, the Coriol cell line, which we sequence in-house. And we have a truth table of what a bunch of labs around the world have said are the truths for uh, indels and SNPs in those particular uh, samples in that cell line. And then we also use synthetic uh, data, which we can create using different tools like BAM Surgeon, where we can actually spike in mutations in different places along different genes and see what our recall rate is when we go back and try to re-go re through our entire pipeline. So we use a combination of a bunch of different tools in order to uh, try to basically prove that you know we have the best of breed in terms of calling the the, the uh, SNPs and indels from a particular sample, and the the problem is is that really it's never perfect, right? So even if you're looking at some of the data today, you'll see there's lots of well maybe you've seen there's lots of weird little edge cases that can come up, and when you start looking at multiple panels across different technologies, there's lots of different edge cases and false positives and false negatives that you have to weed through. And this is what we spend months and months agonizing and, and uh, arguing about, uh, trying to figure out how we're going to deal with that. And often what we'll do is we'll actually even go back to the lab when we, ha when we have something which we don't really know. Well, we don't know what the truth is for that. We'll get them to resequence the technology, maybe even 
or the sequence, uh, maybe even using something like Sanger sequencing to see if they can pick that up using even another method. Um, one of the problems that we have, so when we're looking at something like the true, the, the Amplicon panel there and the can comprehensive cancer panel is that because they're two different technologies, they're actually run through two different uh, pipelines. And what happens when you run them through two different pipelines is that often you have these weird little things, these little gotchas uh, that, can, that can get you. So if you're looking at, if you're trying to compare all the variants that you found in one, using one technology versus another technology, and you haven't done something like what we're talking about here, which is left justification, you may think that you're actually looking at different variants, but you're still looking at the same variant. So for example, if you look at this particular uh, one here, we have a CAG, the variant in this case is the deletion of the A. Different aligners and different callers can actually give you a VCF that reports that as a different type of variant at different locations. So it could be reported as a CA, the loss of the A, an AG with just the G, and, or an A with a deletion. And so what we do is we have to, there's different tools that you can get out there that will take all of this information in your VCS and they'll left justify them so that they all look like a CA to a C in that same location, independent of which technology you ran it on. And if you don't do that though, you're going to end up with a lot of headaches. Um, here's another example which uh, Greg, Greg loves this example. He found this one here. Um, and this is a, a place where you can really get lost in the weeds. And you can see here that there's a, a, a large deletion on the Illumina up top there in that one location. Um, the ion torrent actually reports a deletion in another area just to the left of that with variants just to the right of it. In fact, it's the same deletion on both on both panels. It's just because they're it's just because if you look at the details of the sequence down below and the, the ACGs and Ts down below, there actually is a, a, a larger repeat in that area. And so we've lost a portion of that. And the way that the aligners have worked is that you've ended up with two separate types of deletions, even though that's actually the same thing. So you can really get lost in some of these edge cases when they come up. And unfortunately, when we're talking about clinical samples, and if it's in an important gene, and if it's in an important area of that gene that could have some clinical relevance, you know, we have to do that deep dive to try to sort that sort of thing out. Uh, then there's also this here, which is um, machine-specific artifacts, uh, which I'm going to show you a little bit more in a, in a second on. But for example, here's the same sample run on two different technologies, uh, one on Illumina, one on the ion torrent. You can see the ion torrent actually calls a variant in that region. Uh, but there's nothing on the Illumina. And then when we go back and validate that using Sanger sequencing or another sequencing run, it actually, the Illumina is the truth in that case. Uh, but if you're running just the ion torrent, you might think there's a variant there. So this is another one of those gotchas. And we, we call those sorts of things sequencing machine-related artifacts. And we came up with a little way to visualize that. Uh, so this, this here is you're looking at a, a panel of, I think, about 100, uh, 100 or so samples. Um, and on the x-axis there, we're looking at the call percentage. Uh, so that's the number of samples that saw a particular variant call. And the minor allele frequency is on the y-axis there. The uh, degree of shading for each of those spots represents the depth of coverage for, each, for that particular variant. So you can see right along the center there, which kind of makes sense, uh, there's right around 0.5, there's a lot of, a lot of calls there. Okay. Uh, but then if you look, you can see up in the corners in the top right, bottom right corner over there uh, that there's a lot, there seems to be little clusters over there. We, we can separate that out actually into point mutations versus indels. Uh, so showing the indels in, in, in uh, green and the SNVs in, in pink. And then we can remove the variants that are found commonly in the population using uh, different databases uh, like Exac and uh, 1000 Genomes. DB SNP, uh, and you can see nicely we've removed all those things that were probably just common SNPs in the population. But what's left, especially in that bottom right-hand corner, are a bunch of mutations that are a low minor allele frequency, but they're found in almost every single one of our samples, and that those are machine artifacts. And so as part of our clinical pipeline, 
we keep track of a lot of these artifacts and we use that as a further step in filtering to make sure that that doesn't bleed through into uh, something that might be called out by the by the uh, the molecular pathology side of the equation. Uh, it also helps of going back to the the original uh, uh, example I showed you there before of you know this is these things over here even though they're at a minor allele frequency we may, we may not have actually used called them in a in a clinical setting but if there's an, a real SNP in there in the actual cancer sample uh, and this was just the germline those would cause you to be uh, messed up you wouldn't you wouldn't detect them if you were just using mutec in a paired uh, tumor normal calling mode so that's that and. Uh, this is basically, this is it. Uh, the summary is it's a lot of pain to translate <laughs> something uh, from the research setting. It's fun to play in the research setting when you have to get down to business and, and translate that into a, a clinical test that can be accredited uh, and that you can document and have everything in place for. It, it can be painful to do that. So any questions at all? Yeah. And then with the, uh, the accreditation agencies require for validation, like are all of those like some, using synthetic data comparing to this? They, yeah, they actually require to see your validation document. And they don't specifically say you need to use synthetic data or use the Coriol cell lines, but they want to see a, a methodology that you used to show that your pipeline is working in your hands, basically. So that can be done through sample swaps through other uh, to other places. I think actually at UHN we we kind of go a little bit overboard and we've detected a lot of these problems that a lot of smaller clinical labs they just don't have uh, bioinformaticians on staff to be able to go and find all these little problems so we we kind of take it to the next level um, but yeah they just require a lot of documentation basically and because the field is so in flux they're they're still not really entirely sure and they're they're um, their accreditation documents that they require keep changing on us as we as we move forward all the time in this particular area. Yeah. Are all the clinical labs reinventing the wheel on their own on this, or is there any coordination between your center? Um, yeah. So you know, there's <laughs> I see the pathologist in the room over there having a good smile there. Um, yeah, I, that's a good question, and I think a lot of them are reinventing of the wheel, and a lot of them are just. Uh, you know, just trying not to look out the windows as they're driving, basically, right? They're, they're, they're just trying not to, they just don't want to know, right? So they just run these things through. So, and I don't want to say anything bad about our lab, but when we ran, when we initially were getting samples from them and looking at the pipeline that they are running through a turnkey piece of software, uh, which I won't say anything bad about, but it's a turnkey piece of software. You just put your sample in and you get a result at the end. We found so many mistakes in the way it was calling variants. But that piece of software is used commonly in clinical labs. Now, does that mean it's a problem? It does in a lot of edge cases, and especially at a clinical research hospital like UHN, it can make a big difference um, because we're looking at more cutting edge, different, looking at variants in places where other people may not look at. Um, but if, you know, if you're looking for your, your standard like germline hereditary BRCA mutation, those, those probably work very well for 99 99.5% of the population being tested. So it's a murky field right now. Yeah. From, from the data you received, the, uh, the sequencing data, mm -hmm. to, to the end, you generate the final report. You say you take how many days to do the meditation, uh, stick to the SOP. It, yeah. yeah, it doesn't take very long. Um, I mean, our turnaround time, Greg, is what for most panels about? Three or three days or something, um, two, that, yeah, yeah the, two to three days. It, the smaller panels in within a day, uh, because you know you can run those, uh, you know the, the the smaller panels that only have like twenty four genes on them. Uh, you can turn that around in in a day, no problem. Now that doesn't add that doesn't account for the interpretation side of thing, which our group does not take care of the interpretation. So what we deliver back to pathology is a, is a VCF that they then put into a piece of software that they use for annotation. And then they have an annotation team that goes through all of those variants and filters them. They have a big flow chart of how they filter all the variants that are found in there to be able to make a final call on that particular sample. That process is a little bit more manual and intensive, so um, it, it takes them a little bit longer to do that. So our turnaround time is very fast. 
in, on the, just the pure data processing side. In this context, like for exome, like, uh, yeah, so in a clinical testing situation, uh, it becomes, it, it definitely becomes tricky, especially for cancer samples where you're dealing with lots of variation. I think when you're dealing with well-known, well-known locations that have been validated, that they're, you know, commonly known in the literature, um, that they're in all of the, the different databases online, and you can see them at a good minor allele frequency, especially germline, at a minor allele frequency of 50%. I think there's no problem in going to that level. Uh, it's when you start trying to look in the, the unknown areas, and especially in cancers, uh, it gets to be a little bit more problematic. And in fact, we actually, although we run the 555 panel in production right now, the actual number of genes that are signed out by the pathologist is a very small subset of that 555. I think it's important to identify too, in the context Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure we are. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And there's lots of cases as. You were mentioning last week when we were having a conversation about in cytogenetics of uh, I forget the gene that was, it's it's well known but but now it's well known that it's not a very good indicator of one particular um, cancer. That's when we had that conversation last week. It wasn't Ross one. It was uh, I can't remember the name. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's lots. Of, yeah. So it, it is muddy. It's a muddy area, um, and so we we just try to follow as best uh, practice as we can, and we just try to really, you know do as comprehensive a job as we can and try to really chase down a lot of edge cases to, to try to sort out the, the wheat from the chaff of this.